Give you some background on how Matt and I came to this soapbox. Um, I think it was the beginning of the school year. Yeah, it was. It was before the freshman season got here. Yeah, it was during mentor training. We had been discussing stuff, and we had just gotten into lots of talks about art, and I think we had some revelations late at night, and um, we just thought it would be a good idea to talk about art and make it something we could share with you guys. So the whole point of this is that this isn't a lecture. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, what we're trying to do here is start a, uh, a discussion amongst our uh, colleagues, peers, fellow students, and one professor at least. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we don't have, um, we don't have the answer. We have answers that Matt and I just happen to have thought out and put for a presentation for you. So at the end of this, we'd love for you guys to talk to us more about it, but we're gonna try and explain some of the conclusions we've drawn. And so when talking about good art, I think we need to start with two basic questions. Um, first off, what is art? art? And uh, that, that is a, uh, very big question, but to put it into um, a frame, if you will, which we'll get to later, um, art is an extension of communication by means of imagination. And um, this can be visual, lyrical, musical, dance, technology even um, can be viewed as an art. And um, from there, you must ask, what the fuck is it for? <laughs> Which I'll turn to George. Um, we're gonna get to that a little bit later, but it's something that we need to address because it's really what is the point of art in society? And that kind of gets us to the next part of our lecture, which is the problem, or the current situation. society has come to view that devalues art um, and how it came to be devalued is through uh, the mass availability or the ma mass access to art um, by means of mass communication um, empowerment of individual personal views um, and by extension electronics and digital distribution. Um, so this has come about sort of invisibly. We haven't really like handed over and said that art is no longer as valuable to us. It's just sort of progressed this way. Because we are literally spammed full of visual and musical information all the time in our lives, we lose value in it. It's not as important to us. Back in the old days, people would travel long distances to hear a concert or something or might go to a famous museum. They couldn't just log on to some uh, website and look at it whenever they wanted to. They couldn't get any music they wanted to. We have torrent sites and pirate sites. You can get whatever you want to listen to nowadays. And um, this devaluation, uh, we believe, has led to uh, the, uh, the state of angst that we call postmodern society. And um, sort of this uh, nihilistic a view of the world in that um, we see the view, or we view the world as having uh, no inherent meaning, therefore we can uh, sort of read in to art whatever we want to see in it. So that's what we're going to also address is this notion that a very common idea about art is that, well, anybody can make art, any art is good art. Um, we're not trying to sit on a high horse and say that we have the right to judge necessarily what is that, but we think there needs to be some parameters and some rules for that. Um, we are living in a world that is too full of relativism. There needs to be some sort of balance. Oh, and um, along with this postmodern nihilistic world, if things aren't as valuable anymore, it kind of ties in philosophically with what happened to us, and that has been the loss of mythology. Um, art throughout the ages has always had some very primal connection with the idea of philosophy and religion. Um, and that has to do with its depiction, or at least the idea behind the sublime. And the sublime is connected to the imagination, and that is, that is what is not comprehensible. And philosophers often speak of art as something higher than what they are doing. Um, when, uh, in Norb Schedler's class, I, uh, I was reading a book called Who is Jesus? 
and uh, it was a search for the historical Jesus. And in the book, uh, the uh, author, Dominic Crossan, often uh, gives responses to previous books that he's published, published. And what I noticed was the most frequent angry response was that Dominic Crossan has destroyed for these people uh, the beauty of Christmas, the art centered around the Christ myth. And uh, uh, to me, that said something very significant about the power of art, that to these people, it wasn't the Bible that they were most upset about, it was what was inspired by the Bible. What was inspired by the sublimity of Christ's deity, or whatever you want to call it. And so, um, anyway, uh, so art serves as sort of a lightning rod to the head that connects us to what we call the sublime. And we'll get to that more, but next <coughs> we want to talk more about where we are. If we're saying that we're in a world that values, that is all about relativity and that, you know, things are expressionistic to the point where anybody can say whatever they want, we need to look at the two um, camps. Um, and historically, those two have been formalism and expressionism, you know, mm. back. Wait, is it back? Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. Formalism and expressionism. Um, the history of this has basically been, um, along with religion, you could say that uh, with the Renaissance, Gothic era, people started depicting things formally, and it has to ties back to antiquity and classical times. People are trying to depict the ideal form of things. They have these ideal notions of how things are supposed to look, what good art is supposed to be. There are rules or an end parameters that they have to abide by. Yeah, to uh, to provide an, an example, um, the uh, figurehead of empiricism, uh, Aristotle, decided he was going to determine what made the best plays of his time the best plays. So he took the seven greatest dramas of Greek theater and examined them and found common themes and techniques, devices used within them and said, all right, if you use all of these, you are going to create a good piece of art that will last. And um, the problem is, or we'll get to the problem with that. Um, you want to hit expression? Yes. Um, you have neoclassicism, which arrives, I think, in the 19th century or the 18th century. But anyway, it's this rebirth of looking at old classical forms, and those basically mean there are rules. But then along with that, you also have romanticism, and it was a very new trend. And it involved having a high level of technique and precision, and yet the content of it was much more emotional, much more personal. And ever since then, as we moved into more modern times, it's, I think it's gone uh, hand in hand with philosophy, there is no ideal, like there is no set ideal that at least we can attain, and so therefore I believe that we are now living in a heavily favored expressionistic society. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right, so with the loss of the ideal, we had, uh, to speak in terms of literature, we had uh, two major movements. The first was called modernism the loss of the ideal. The modernists were a bunch of um, pussies who, uh, <laughs> who, who <laughs> I'm sorry, Phil, but uh, <laughs> who saw the loss of the ideal and said, oh no, what are we going to do now? But they didn't really uh, provide any sort of solution. It, it was more of a lament. And then we, uh, after uh, the modernists, we have these uh, laughing jokesters called the uh, postmodernists who come out and really their response is, who gives a flying hoot nanny? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that there is no ideal. And, and what Jordan and I have seen in this view, who gives a flip uh, whether or not there is an ideal, is that it's led to a sort of passive apathy when viewing art. 